In this last session, we're going to be looking at how we need a good king. We need a good leader. We need God as our leader. But we're going to do that by looking at a passage that is the most disturbing for me in the entire scriptures. It's Judges chapter 19, set amid the last five chapters of the book of Judges, where we have the story of the Levite and his concubine and how she is raped and then after her death dismembered. And then there's a civil war. It's a very, very disturbing story indeed, but it's one that shows us precisely why we need good leadership. And as we see in the book of Judges, things are often getting worse. As you trace the book of Judges, a lot of people would see that the, the judges seem to be getting worse. And then as we read the book of Judges, we also see that it's the story, the book, with the most gore in the entire Bible, the most description of the violation of body, bodily integrity. There are other books in the Bible which record more deaths, but this is the one that will tell you about blood and guts. It tells you in chapter one about um, Adonai Bezek's thumbs and big toes being cut off. In chapter three, about Eglon's belly being pierced. In chapter four, about Sisera's head. Chapter um, nine, about Abimelech's head. Chapter 16, about Samson's eyes. And climactically in this chapter, about the uh, Levite's concubine being cut up. It's a very, very disturbing story indeed. And in the context of these chapters, four times we read, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And it also says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's showing us how wrong things go without the right leadership. So let's read this passage, this difficult passage from Judges chapter 19. Let's read God's word, starting at Judges chapter 19 and verse one. In those days, when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him. And she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. Then we read about how the father-in-law just delays him time and time again. He wants to get up and he keeps him uh, there until the fifth day. And then when he gets up to leave, it's actually far too late uh, for him to be setting off, but he sets off anyway. And that's uh, in verse 10. But the man, that's the Levite, would not spend the night. He rose up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. Uh, he had with him a couple of saddled donkeys and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over and the servant said to his master, come now, let's turn aside to this city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, we will not turn aside into the city of the foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his young man, come and let's draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city for no one took them into his house to spend the night. So the story begins with a Levite having a concubine. A concubine is a second tier wife. So a woman who is not given the normal rights of a wife. And yet he doesn't have a first tier wife. So the first thing we see is that this man is in an abusive relationship with this woman. She's then unfaithful to him and she goes off to her father's house for four months. And for four months, he does nothing about this. Then finally he gets up and he goes uh, to the house and it says he speaks kindly to her. He knew how to use his words well to charm her and win her back. But we'll see that although he spoke kindly to her, he didn't really care about her when we look at how he treats her later. But he seems to get on very well with his father-in-law. 
They have a lovely time. The father-in-law is so glad to see him, they enjoy their feasting. And we'll see in this story that other men will have a good time feasting together, enjoying the relationship with each other when they're not uh, relating to the women as they should. So after five days, finally he gets up when it's too, too late and they have to set off, but actually it's getting dark soon. And the servant says, well, let's turn aside to this city, Jebus, which becomes Jerusalem later, which doesn't have Israelites in it. And the man, the Levite, piously says, no, let's go on to an Israelite place. We don't want to stay with foreigners. You know what foreigners are like. They might be harmful. And so instead he turns aside to an Israelite city from the tribe of Benjamin, Gibeah, which actually is the city of Saul. So remember the concubine is from Bethlehem, uh, where David comes from. And here we have the city of Gibeah, which becomes the city of Saul later on. And they go in and no one takes them in. They're there in the city square and no one is hospitable to them. That's where we pick up the most disturbing part of the story in chapter 19 and verse 22. A man has come from the hill country of Ephraim and he's very hospitable to them. He offers everything and they're having a very, very good time together. And now this is what we read, verse 22. As they were making uh, their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly since this man has come into my house. Do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out to you now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. And her master rose up in the morning and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's be going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man rose up and went away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife and taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day, consider it, take counsel and speak. Well, what a disturbing story that is. And what we find is that this story, which is in Judges chapter 19, has echoes of another story in Genesis chapter 19. The story in Genesis chapter 19 is about how two angels went to visit Sodom and they were visiting Lot in that city of Sodom, which became the city proverbial for its wickedness. And there, very similarly, the men from the city knock on the door and say they want to have uh, sex with, with the guests. And Lot, very similarly, offers his daughters, which is shameful. And we, we find out how in uh, the book of Genesis. In fact, later on in that same chapter, those daughters make Lot drunk and he has non-consensual sex uh, with them. So he, he gets paid back in a sense. And that's one of those things that happens often in, Ge in, in Genesis. But here we have in the book of Judges something happening which is even worse than happens in Genesis. That thing that happened in Genesis in one of those pagan, proverbially pagan towns now in the tribe of Israel, something is happening which is worse. Because it's not only that they say they won't put the women out, actually one of them does get put out and she gets violated all night and she gets killed. And, and we also see that the man, the older man, 
even says, violate them. He offers his own daughter. There is just terrible behaviour on the part of all of the Israelites. And the passage doesn't give us the full horror of what that woman underwent. It passes over the sorts of pains, the full description of what she must have experienced that night. But what it does do this is it depicts how she comes and she collapses on the doorstep and her hands are on the threshold and yet she's shut out. Her hands are there where it says her master was, not her husband, her master, because he was in an abusive relationship with her and he was having a good night's sleep. And we see the immense callousness as he gets up in the morning, opens a door and expects her just to be able to resume a journey. And he says to her, get up, and she doesn't respond. He is hard hearted. In fact, we've seen earlier this man who had spoken in such a friendly way to this woman to charm her just a few days earlier. At this point, uh, night had thrust her out, had taken her by force. She had no choice in this. And she was thrust out to the crowd in order to preserve his life. In order to protect him, he had substituted another. How cowardly can you get? So the shame of this, and we see the tragedy of the story. And we should be shocked by that. It's not meant to be anything other than shocking. When we read this story and it, it seems there isn't enough shock, um, it, th there is. It's, the shock is portrayed in the bluntness of these words. We're meant to see this as the most terrible reaction uh, that the man could have had. He's a terrible man. But what results from this is he then tries to stir up people against the tribe of Benjamin and he sends off this woman's body parts in 12 parts to the different tribes and says, look at the outrage that's occurred. And everyone, having received body parts, is shocked and they're ready to wreak vengeance. And so the different tribes come together. But the people of Gibeah's tribe, Benjamin, they rally round Gibeah. And the people of the other tribes, they're ready to condemn Gibeah, as they should be. And so they say, we're going to wipe them out. And then there's civil war. And the civil war goes on, and it's a very unusual one. Because in this uh, case, there are 400,000 Israelites fighting against Benjamin. They have so many more of them, and yet for two days, they lose soldiers. In fact, they lose one-tenth of all of the Israelites are lost as they fight against Benjamin. And then finally, on the third day, God gives that city of Gibeah over into their hands in language completely reminiscent of the destruction of Ai or Ai in the book of Joshua, which was a Canaanite city. In other words, the message is coming loud and clear that at this point, Israel, with all the privileges that God had given it, the law, uh, Moses, the leadership of Joshua and so on, Israel, in a very, very short time, has gone far astray. They've gone as far astray as the nations that God drove out They've gone as far astray as the most proverbially wicked nation, uh, a city of Sodom, had gone astray. That's how bad God's people had become. That's the shock of this. And it's a story in which there are no good guys. Even the woman who is the, the most, uh, she's an innocent victim. She hadn't had no specific guilt that merited the consequence she's got. It's terrible what happened to her. She was an innocent victim. And yet even at the beginning of the story, we read of her unfaithfulness. But the man who is so callous uh, is surely very, very wrong. And we read of the older gentleman who was prepared to put out his daughter. Again, very wrong. At every stage, the characters are wrong. And of course, the people of Gibeah are particularly wrong. But as we read about this civil war, there's something interesting that goes on. And that is the civil war is based on misinformation because when people have come together in shock as this man has sent body parts of, of the concubine to the different tribes they come together and say we really must do something about this what has happened and this is what the levite says chapter 20 verses 4 and 5 can you see what's wrong with it 
Chapter 20, verse 4. And the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah, that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine to spend the night, and the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house against me by night. They meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine, and she is dead. Can you see how he's missing out some absolutely vital information about how he thrust her out, that he pushed her out, and he also adds the bit that their intention was to kill him. We don't know that. But what we realise is that he, he was so focused on his own safety that anyone else could be at risk for him. He just wanted to preserve his life and he was prepared uh, to trample on this woman in order to do that. And that's the basis on which they go to war. In other words, when the Israelites are thinking that they are the righteous judges of Benjamin, they are also harbouring iniquity in their midst. They also deserve judgment. And that's the situation which uh, then results in the destruction of the entire tribe of Benjamin except for 600 men. And there are no 600 men. Well, there are no women at all from the tribe of Benjamin. So everyone's fearful that Israel is going to lose a tribe. And the Israelites have also made a foolish vow saying that none of them will give their daughters to Benjamin in marriage. So they come up with two solutions to this. Firstly, there's a city that hasn't sent anyone to fight, Jabesh Gilead. They go and kill all, off all of them except for 400 of their young women who are to marry the Benjaminites. That leaves 200 Benjaminites without wives. Their solution is this. The Benjaminites can go and raid the festival at Shiloh and just grab women. And that's how the book ends with these ominous words, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this is a story about violence against a woman and their solution to all of that was more violence against women. So you see what a terrible plight that we're, is being portrayed in this book. And that's why this book speaks to today. It's precisely because the book of Judges is about such mess that it speaks to our situations which are so messy. When we look at the stories of pain and of oppression in the world, they are countless. They are more than our hearts can possibly begin to fathom. When you read a statistic like 73 million abortions in a year, it's not something that we can fathom in terms of the stories of sadness and the stories of sin that have led to that. That, as a global figure, is about one-tenth of the population of the continent of Europe every single year. And we see things that's going on with, with people trafficking and smuggling, um, uh, the sex industry, uh, all sorts of things that's going on that are oppressing the most vulnerable and many things that are particularly oppressing women. And we look at how there has been uh, a reaction where people have said publicly, there's a lot of male violence against women. And they, there, there was a movement called the Me Too movement, you remember just recently, uh, which, which was calling it out. And then what came after that was another hashtag, another thing, Church Too movement, showing that it was not just something that was happening out uh, they're outside the church. It's happening within the church. As we see in the book of Judges, it's the people of God who can commit uh, many of these sins just as badly as elsewhere. And it's in that context of a broken world and a broken church that we need leaders. That's where we need leaders of integrity, leaders who are careful using their words. This is where we need leaders who, like Ehud, are using the sword of the word of God. We need people who, like Gideon, will speak up and be brave. We need people not like Samson who are not following their own lusts and, and their own pleasures. People who are not shooting their mouth off uh, like Jephthah. We need leaders of integrity. But there are um, four particular points I want to make from this passage just briefly as we close. One application, we need leaders who love. Secondly, we need leaders with the right values. Thirdly, we need leaders who find out facts. And fourthly, of course, we need the supreme leader, our Lord Jesus Christ. So firstly, let's think about leaders who love. 
This is a story about a man who knew how to talk the talk. He could sound very charming to this concubine. The, the phrase, he spoke to her heart, it's a phrase also used of Samson in Judges chapter 14, where he was charming that woman down at Timnah. He knew how to speak in a charming way. But when he was under pressure, we see what he does. He is the one who comes first and he puts out this woman. And you see all along, those were just vain words. They weren't real. He didn't love. And what a contrast between him and our Lord Jesus Christ, who put himself to suffering for us. He didn't substitute another. He himself took the suffering that we deserve. That wouldn't de woman didn't deserve the suffering, but even though we do deserve the suffering, Christ took that on himself when he went to the cross. What an amazing thing. What a contrast there is between the man and his concubine and Christ loving the church. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What an amazing thing that he gave himself up for the church and a complete contrast with what we have here. We need leaders who love, we need husbands who love, we need people who are gonna stand up and love even though it's painful. Secondly, we need leaders with the right values. In this passage, there are a couple of times when we see very, very strange values. One is where this Levite is saying, well, let's pass by these foreigners. We don't want to have anything to do with the foreigners. And, and yet, even though he seems to have this sense of morality, yet he's prepared to thrust this woman out to the crowd. We see the older man from the hill country of Ephraim who says, don't outrage my guest, my male guest. Oh, but you can violate my virgin daughter. What a, an outrageous way by any system of morality that he should think like that. He, in an ancient culture, you would be protecting your uh, guests uh, under any count and he should be protecting um, this man's concubine. And under any culture, a father's primary uh, protection is for his daughter. How can this possibly happen? But he has this sense of values in which he wants to be a good host to the man. And what we see nowadays is not that people have no values, but they have twisted moral values, that they have taken maybe some good bit and they've m blended it with something else and they just have a completely disrupted sense of values. We know that uh, within the Third Reich, people had moral values that could run alongside the terrible things that they were doing in the death camps, in the concentration camps. And, and that's what can happen today. People's moral compass can be lost so that they have actually lots of language and morality that they're talking all the time and yet their values aren't scriptural. And that's why we need Christians, leaders who are basing their values on the Bible. Thirdly, we need leaders who find out facts. The whole of Israel went to civil war based on misinformation. Very, very easily, we can hear half of a story and choose a side and pile on against the other side. And this is a story which really warns us against that. It's the easy thing is just to take things as they seem to be and not to dig down. And Christian leaders are told by this, we need to dig down and base our decisions on facts. But finally, and most wonderfully, this passage points us by so much contrast to Christ. How, just as in those days there was no king in Israel, everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, that shows us how we really do need the good and true king. You know that woman, that victim from Bethlehem? She's not the only one in the Bible from Bethlehem. David came from Bethlehem and later Christ came from Bethlehem. Christ was born as a king in Bethlehem, the king that we need. And he went as a voluntary sacrifice for us. He wasn't thrust out of the house unwillingly. He left his father's house in glory willingly to come for us. Every human leader will disappoint but Christ will never disappoint. As you read the book of Judges, you look at these different stories of mess. Look to Christ and remember, he is the leader that we're called to be like. He's the only true and lasting saviour. Let's model 
our lives on him.